This is the official Winning Time podcast from HBO, Hyper Object Industries, and Pineapple Street Studios. I'm Rodney Barnes. I want to build something special. The Los Angeles Lakers select... The entire league is on the verge of bankruptcy. Irvin. With me, it's going to be exciting. Magic. Our girls, they won't cheer. They'll dance. Johnson. It's showtime! This week on Winning Time, we're doing something a little different. We're stepping outside the world of 1970s L.A. and talking to one of the biggest Laker fans of all time to get his take on the show. I'm sitting down with my good friend, Snoop Dogg. But before we bring on Snoop, let's run it back and recap episode six of Winning Time. The situation in Lakerland is bleak. Coach McKinney is still alive after that traumatic bike accident, but he's down for the count to say the least. And no one is freaking out more than his assistant coach, Paul Westhead. That's Jack McKinney, he's my best friend. So what I need to hear from you is what you're gonna do to fix him up because we have a fucking game tomorrow. Meanwhile, Jerry Buss is up shit creek. When the great Western Bank comes knocking at his door, Buss has to figure out a way to pay off old loans used to purchase the Lakers. Surprise, he doesn't have the money. What he does have? Charm, wit, and his comb over. You can shake us down and come up with pocket lint, or you can dig down deep into those fancy suits you got, try to find the balls to stay in business with the Lakers. Add to that, Mama Bus, played by the legend Sally Field, has written a bunch of bad checks to food and beverage vendors for the forum. None of the vendors have been paid. No. The whole debacle reveals that her physical and mental health is declining and Jerry Buss can no longer rely on the one person he's trusted more than anyone. Speaking of trust, magic is overwhelmed. Being a pro is more than just playing basketball. It's also about big business, branding, and figuring out who's really got your back. Pops got Mr. Bowman out of D-Town. Needs to find an attorney for a Michigan attorney. If it is, don't know his dick from a door knob. My next guest. I could take a half hour introducing my next guest. Pop culture figure, entrepreneur, actor, the iconic Snoop Dogg. Welcome to the show. Hey, man, thank you for having me, Rock and Rod. You know what it is. It's morning time, baby. So when was your first memory of being a Lakers fan? The year before Magic Johnson came to the Lakers. Really? Yeah. They wasn't that good, but they had Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. And I love Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. And I just something about the Lakers that just was appealing to me. And then when they got Magic, because yes. I had seen Magic play in that championship game against Larry Bird, and I fell in love with him. I'm like, he is the shit. <laughs> and when we got him, I was like, oh, my God, this, this Lakers for life. Did you go actually go to the games, or was it just on TV? You know, damn well nigga had no money in the motherfucking I'm 70s just, and 80s. You know what? I don't know. You know. <laughs> We go to another nigga house and watch it. We probably even had no TV. They watching the game down the street. <laughs> well, yeah, that, that that's one way to get the game, man. I mean, you know they didn't have no ESPN back then, nigga. If you missed it, you missed it. <laughs> um, so as the Lakers evolved and you sort of evolved and became part of the whole music scene, two of y'all seemed to come together. It's like you became a part of the Laker history and the Laker lore. How did that come together? I think my fandomonium, me just loving the team, just wearing Laker shit everywhere, getting personal with the locker room. Before they got um, Kobe and Shaq, uh, Nick Van Exel was one of my homies. We used to hang out tough. And I liked that squad. They was dope because they, mm -hmm. they played hard. Mm -hmm. Then we got uh, Kobe and Shaq, and it was like, the team felt young like me. Right. It felt like they were my peers. So I would go to games. I would I would meet them, get their numbers, hang out with them, get tickets to the game, hang out with them after the game. And it became like, you know, I'm actually a player because whenever they fuck up, I say shit. <laughs> when they do good, I say shit. And nobody had a problem with it because they're like, hey, we don't want to make dog mad because it's like I was in the locker room with them. Yeah. Did you have a relationship with any of the Showtime Lakers, Magic, Kareem, Dr. Buss, any of them? What's crazy is I grew up a fan of Magic and Kareem, right? right. Like, these are my one-two. People always say Jordan number one in my book is MJ, Magic Johnson. So 
when I meet Magic, he knows me. We play in a celebrity basketball game. I end up putting a shoe out. He promotes my shoe. I play in a game with him. We do business together. He does interviews for me. All of the shit that I'm, like, dreaming of as a kid, he doing for me. Wow. Then when I meet Kareem, me and Kareem hanging out, you know, doing what we do. You understand me? <laughs> and uh, the homie brought him to me, right? This is a funny story. The homie brought him to me. And he was like, man, Kareem want to meet you. I said, well, what the fuck is you doing? Bring him in here. Kareem came in tall as a motherfucker, just taller than everybody. And he stood in the back and he said, uh, uh, let me, we'll walk. I passed that motherfucker up. It was like I was reaching up to a whole motherfucking uh, <laughs> 10 foot goal. <laughs> and the homie that brought him in, he was like, he was like, hey, Kareem, can I get a picture? And then Kareem turned his back and walked out on him. I said, he had called guys. <laughs> but, Rod, look what I got. Uh-oh. This Kareem Abdul-Jabbar's all-star ring from 1971 oh, and 1985. We became real good friends to where when I got my Hollywood Walk of Fame, I looked in the fucking crowd, and he was there. Wow. That shit fucked me up, man. Like, he uh, don't imagine come seeing for just anybody. Man, he was there with a suit on, sitting in the front row. My mama, Dr. Dre, Warren G, DOC, nigga, Kareem, Jim Hill, and Kareem was there, oh, cuz. You just don't understand what that means to a kid. Oh, yeah. That grew up watching them do their thing and them come and give me my respect. And t uh he had a um he had an auction one once upon a time. Okay. And he was like, I'm about to auction off some things. Can you help me promote it and get people to... I remember that. I said, Kareem, it ain't much I wouldn't do for you, but I'm going to tell you this. Can I see what you're auctioning first so I can have first dibs and some shit in there? Because I would hate to help you sell some <laughs> shit that I wanted. <laughs> he was like, all right, I'm going to send my peoples over to see what you... I said, ooh, I was born in 71. I need that all-star ring from 71. Ooh, 85, I was 14. I just turned into an adolescent. I need that one, too. Give me 71, 85 all-star rings. Damn. Done. Yeah, so I'm a Dr. J fan, and I don't have that same relationship with Dr. J that you got. As I do. I'm fighting to get, if I, you know, before I leave this earth, in fact, if I could die holding the picture of me and Dr. J in my hand before I go, he shook my right, hand. Right, I'm going to make it happen. Let me tell you how, how I met Dr. J years ago. And every time we would see each other, we would chop it up because I'm like, this nigga's a pimp. He ain't no basketball player. This nigga's smooth as a motherfucker. So one, 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 one day, me and him chilling, right? And I'm like, Doc, man, I want to ask you a question. Man, how the fuck did you get that role to fish to save Pittsburgh? That was one of my favorite fucking movies. You was Moses Guthrie. You was Duncan and Stacey Adams and Slacks and Big Ass Natro. Magic Mona was, you know... Fixing y'all games and shit. <laughs> and nigga said, man, let me tell you, Snoop. You ain't going to believe it when I tell you. He said, man, I was coming out here playing against the Lakers. And it was some filmmaker that wanted to do a movie starring Magic Johnson. Magic wouldn't give him the time of day. So he started approaching Dr. J every time they come to play the Lakers. Dr. J said, the nigga pulled up on him one day and told him, I got the movie that's going to change your life and this and that. Game, I think he said 100000 and he signed on for the deal and did the fish that saved Pittsburgh. Because if you notice, if you watch that movie, Chick Hearn is in it. Yep. Norm Nixon is in it. Yep. Kareem is in it. So it all made sense to me that, damn, that should have been magic going against them. But he went and got Dr. J, which made it even more because Dr. J was bigger than magic at that time. Yeah. For that moment coming over from the ABA, Dr. J was the man. The, from the Converse deal and all of that. It's all over my world. That's wall. why I still wear checks to this day. I don't play in nothing but checks, Rodney. Damn. Now, you know I'm going to hit you back up about this Dr. J thing now. You don't open up another door. So, uh, Snoop, let's talk about the Showtime Lakers from the place of entertainment. How Dr. Bust and that whole idea, Genie, Bust, and all of that, they changed the entertainment factor of basketball. Can you talk to that yeah, a little bit? Yeah, they changed all of that. Yeah, yeah well, well, if you went there and you were a celebrity, it's, you got a chance to see exactly what being a Laker fan was about. You know, Genie would come down, and she was an amazing host, beautiful person, beautiful spirit. She would always come down and say all of the right things, and, you try to pay for shit they wouldn't let you pay for it. And then all of a sudden, you know, if I'm by myself, hey, my dad, dad wants you up top. 
I go up top to this, you know, where he at, and he, we chill for a minute. He's saying, you coming to the Laker club? You coming to the Forum club? You coming to the, you know, Woo-Wop, where they built a the little thing underground? No problem. I'm in there. You know what mm-hmm. I'm saying? Hanging out with the stars. We having a good time. The basketball players. Even the teams that lost or they played against, some of them niggas are being there. <laughs> like, nigga, you just lost. What are you doing in here? Did you even shower? <laughs> it was that kind of fun, like, to where... After the game was over with, you look forward to not leaving the building but going underground in the building and having a good time and mingling. And Because sometimes when you're at the game, for example, if I'm sitting on this side of the floor and somebody's on this side of the floor, I can't walk across the floor and shake the nigga hands. And, you yeah, know what I'm saying? Yeah, I can't yeah. do none of that shit. It's one of them, what's happening, my nigga? But then in the forum club, it's the... Right. Mm. Yeah. So it was like the, I see you. Cameras flat showing all of the celebrities in here, but they're really not together. But when the game is over with, we all together. Nice. And I noticed too, other stadiums, when you go to other arenas, there's they have a forum club like set up now. They used to didn't have. I was at the Capitol Center when I was a kid. They had nothing like that back then. And now every place that you go, I was at the All-Star game, we presented the show a while back. And it had like an entertainment type component to it that you can't help but say was connected to Dr. Buss and what they did. Man, Dr. Buss changed the dynamics of sports in general. And I believe that what he did was it was groundbreaking and it was it was, it was was different and it was edgy because nobody had ever seen what he did as far as putting that team together and then bringing the entertainment value as far as having the dancers, the celebrities sitting on the floor, you know, mm-hmm. the ticket price, and just the excitement of going to the game. Like the celebrities was watching basketball players like they were celebrities. Right. So it was a, a mutual love. All right. Um, wanted to ask you about what do you think the Lakers represent? Because to me, I look at L.A., it's a very diverse community, but it's also segregated in its own way as well. Well, if you ask me, Rod, the Lakers is the melting pot to L.A. Right, yeah. If you put a map up of California and you put Laker fans, you'll cover up probably the majority of the map until you get to Golden State and them types of areas. But when you come to Southern California and you put up gangs, Mm -hmm. put up gangs, a map of gangs, and then put up when the Lakers win championships, regular games, or having a great season, those gangs become one gang, the Laker gang. Right. Piggybacking off of that, what do you think about the connection between L.A. sports in general and black culture? L.A. sports and black culture go hand in hand, and Latin culture. You can't leave yes. them out either yes. because it's, 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 it's black and brown. That's what it is, and that's what draws us together. It's because we naturally love camaraderie, we love teamwork, and we love to root for something that's that's the spirit of us because the L.A. team basically take on the spirit of L.A. people. That's why you got avid Dodger fans, Laker fans, Clipper fans, what they saw as. Just, <laughs> his fans are just dedicated to their teams. <laughs> You mentioned something earlier about not being able to afford to go to the games. And, you know, the forum is located in Inglewood. Do you yeah. think there's an issue with the community of Inglewood and, you know, our people and being able to go afford to go to the games back when they were there before they went to the Crypto.com, Crypto.com Center, I guess it is right now? No, that's what I think the people loved about Dr. Buss. He made it affordable. He made it feasible. Right. Even when he put the floor seats down, he always kept seats that you could pay for with a great view. That's one thing he always focused on was the business of his business and to be able to have people come. And then he was smart enough to create that motherfucking prime ticket network. When he popped that on their motherfucking dog head asses and made people be able to watch it from the house, that was a bigger draw if you ask me. The Showtime Lakers. What do you think, other than Magic and Kareem and all of that and the actual winning, what do you think actually, because to me, The Showtime Lakers, that style of play influences how the game is played today. That up-tempo style, the entertainment factor, all of that stuff. What did it mean to you watching Showtime? It was like I was watching the Harlem Globetrotters organized, playing real basketball against a real team every night. Magic was like one of the fucking Globetrotters. Kareem with that massive sky hook. The energy, the Laker girls, just the way they play, like you said, just fast-paced. The Koopa Loop, Chick Hearn announcing the games. It should have flavor to it, man. Chick Hearn sounded like one of the homies announcing the games. 
<laughs> the jellos jiggling, all of yeah, them. Magic Johnson yo yoing the ball up and down in the corner. He passes the ball over to Cooper. Cooper over to Nixon. Nixon up. Score! Sky hook. I got a chance to meet all of them, and, and I feel like they all had something to do with my childhood. For example, when I met Jamal Wilkes, I was calling him Cornbread mm. from the movie Cornbread Earl and Me. Mm -hmm. Because as a kid, he was such a fucking great actor in that movie. He was. And it was like, that's who I thought he was. I thought that's who the fuck he was in real life. And the shot, he had that smooth shot, the silk. Mm -hmm. His shit was amazing. And I got a chance to meet him. And the conversation that we had was like, they knew me. Like, you got to understand, I'm still a little, little ass kid on the inside. Michael Cooper, hang out with Coop with his long ass socks. <laughs> he signs a basketball for me. I got his basketball. He the first Laker to ever sign something. Wow. Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, like I said, when I meet him, James Worthy, you know what I'm saying? So it's like all of these people that I meet, Norm Nixon, me and him hung out a couple of times. He's a player. Yes, he is. Yeah, Storm and Norman, man, that's that's my guy, man. Like, he's a real one. Um, it's just something about them, man, that, that, that the way they played and the way you see them on TV is the way they were in real life. And that's 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 compelling to somebody who ended up becoming a celebrity because I knew how to handle people based off of the way that they handled me and the way that they handled their fans. Like, you never hear anything about Lakers and their fans having a misunderstanding. On a somber note, uh, you bought Kobe Bryant a car when he retired, right? What I did was I had built a Laker car, yes. and I had built it in his name, and I was like, damn, what could I give him as a gift for retirement, everybody gonna give him a basketball or some regular shit, a tie. <laughs> I'm like, I'm trying to get this nigga some shit that's that's gonna be memorable that when he see it, he ain't gonna understand it, but he gonna know what it mean. So built the car all the way up, got it right, white interior, yellow, purple, had all the OG Lakers, the Showtime Lakers on the front, spray painted, Chick Hearn, Magic Johnson, then I put me, Kobe, and Shaq with them. Wow. So pick him up, he fly out here, pick him up from the airport, I pick him up, put him in the passenger seat, I got GoPros and shit all in the car. Me and him riding from LAX to my spot and people riding on the side of us like, is that Snoop and Kobe? <laughs> and you could just see he ain't never been in the low rider because he's sitting up <laughs> like this. I'm like, nigga, you gotta lean back, nigga. Put some cool on it, nigga, lean out the window, put your elbow on the thing, you know what I'm talking about? <laughs> but I felt, I felt honored to be able to have him come see me that day because it was just about me and him just chopping it up after his retirement and me just wanting to tell him how much he meant to me and the family. And then I ended up blessing him with the gift, but he blessed us with a gift. He touched everybody in this motherfucker that day. Even the people that cleaned my studio was like, we got a picture with Kobe Bryant, he was so nice. Then I had these people over here, Trap Kitchen, that make pineapple bowls and shit. That nigga ate that motherfucker so fast and took two to the house with him. <laughs> So, winning time, the rise of the Lakers dynasty. What do you think of the show? Um, you think we get it right? You think we, we're doing the Lakers justice? Now, as far as the visual, the optics, y'all got that shit right, all the way right. Now, as far as the story, I love what the story's about, but like I say, when you're dealing with personal and it's going to be a little, you know, back flat, oh, it didn't happen that way, it did this and that. Right. But I feel like, with you being connected to this, is going to be true and authentic. The episodes, people are anxious to see them. They can't wait. You know, we hate waiting every week. Wish you motherfuckers would just put them all out at one time. What the fuck is going on? They got to wait every week to see this shit. The fuck is y'all on, man? Nigga want to binge. Ain't that what they call that shit? That's what Niggas ain't got me addicted to binging and shit. Nigga, put it up. <laughs> now, but it looked like it's going to be amazing, though, because the people that you cast it look like great actors, and they look so like yeah. the Lakers used to look, the graininess of the shot, Dr. Bust, the excitement, the, the the aura. It's like you guys captured the aura and the essence. One thing I love about period piece shows and movies is when they get it right. What I don't want to hear is somebody in this series saying it's all good or for sure. <laughs> No, they wasn't no, saying no, that no, shit back no, then. No, no, no. no so yeah. if I hear that, that just make me turn the channel. Just, <laughs> and Magic Johnson run down the court talking about for shizzle, my nizzle. Man, turn this shit, man. <laughs> Cooper, get your bitch they ass over here. To... Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Rod, that'd be the first thing I look for when it be pieces like this. Yeah. Did they get the etiquette right? Yes. Did they get the look right? And did they get the style and the feel 
of what that shit was. Yeah. I mean, we work really, really hard to to put together an authentic, you know, take on this whole thing. Um, painstakingly so. And I think to get an endorsement from someone like yourself, who's a true fan of the L.A. Lakers, it means a lot. It, it means a lot. Man, we need this. We deserve this. Our franchise has been one of the one of the key components to Los Angeles and just the world in general, bringing people together. I go around the world. There's so many Laker fans that are really family based off of the Lakers. Like, they made people become family. Snoop, I love you. Can't thank you enough. I look forward to talking again. All right, Hot Rod, you be cool, man. I'll see you in a minute or two. Peace and love, y'all. All right, man. We're almost out of time here, but before the game clock hits double zeros, I want to share our buzzer beater moment of the episode, that little behind the scenes moment you may have missed. There is nothing that Jack McKinney would want more than a win. Paul Westhead, played by Jason Siegel, knows his basketball. I swear, the man is a hoop head. Gives sorrow words. The grief that does not speak whispers the orfrot heart and bids it break. Despite seeming like a hopeless Shakespearean, Paul Westhead is the only coach in basketball history to have won an NBA and WNBA championship as a head coach. That's not bad for a former English teacher turned coach. Thanks for listening to the official Winning Time podcast. And a special thank you to our guest, Snoop Doggy Dog. You can watch new episodes of Winning Time on HBO Max Sunday nights. Our next episode comes out on April the 17th. See you then. This is the official Winning Time Companion podcast. And it's a production of HBO, Pineapple Street Studios, and Hyper Object Industries. Our executive producers are Harry Nelson, Claire Slaughter, Gabrielle Lewis, Barry Finkel, Max Linsky, and Jenna weiss -Berman. Our lead producer on the show is Jess Hackle. Aaron Kelly is our managing producer. Shaka Mali, Jonathan Shiflett, and Elliot Adler are our producers. Darby Maloney is our editor, and our engineers are Davey Sumner and Jason Richards. Production music is courtesy of HBO, and you can watch episodes of Winning Time on HBO Max.